Amen. Hey, grab your Bibles, fire up your devices. We're in Romans chapter 8. We are in the last two installments of, well, the first half of Romans, the doctrine of Romans, and then we'll move into an Advent study. And then in uh, 2020, we'll pick back up the second half of uh, the book of Romans. Can you believe we're talking about 2020? It seems uh, far-fetched to me. Uh, When I was but a wee little lad, I thought 2020, I'd be flying around on a little airship. I'd have a little pill for dinner, and I have a dog named Astro. Uh, But apparently, that's not true. Uh, I still drive a regular car. Uh, I don't eat a pill for dinner. And well, I got a dog named Wally. So... Here we are, Romans chapter 8. Let's dig in here. I was 21. uh, I was in college, and the Lord was doing something pretty cool in my life. This was one of those instances where you would say he was doing some of the great things, a a really great work uh, within me. It was during this period of time also that the Lord, well, he, he broke me, and he began to rebuild me. And man, that was not easy. It was hard. It was difficult. And at times, it was downright painful. It was during this time of, well, suffering and uh, and hardship and discovery that I, well, came to realize that God had created me on purpose and for a great purpose. And it was then in my daily reading, I ran across this verse in Philippians. I was challenged by a mentor of mine every year to get a new Bible a Bible of a different version that I'd read the year before, and, well, to read through it with this new version so I could have kind of new eyes on the Word of God and to take notes. And in this particular year, I was reading out of the Amplified Version. And so here's what it says in Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified. Now, understand, Paul is sharing his enthusiasm for ministry. He's sharing his excitement for the gospel with his brothers and his sisters in Philippi. And his passion reaches, you could say, a climax of sorts when he gets to chapter 3, verse 10, with a statement of purpose in his life. And so here's what it reads in the Amplified, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, experientially becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in that same way experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did. And so you'll notice there on your notes, it starts off with my purpose is. So during this time as I'm reading through the Amplified Version, I come to this text in chapter 3, verse 10, and well, I I begin to uh, take to heart this passage, and I decided that I'm going to kind of camp out on, well, a phrase for a week or two, and just to really ponder it, and to think about it, and to memorize it, and uh, well, it's in your notes here, one, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. So for a period of of days, a a week or so, I I thought continually and daily on this passage about becoming more acquainted with him. And so I would focus my time and my attention on knowing him deeply and more intimately and progressively. I would spend extended time with him. I'd go out to Lake Clinton there outside of Lawrence, Kansas, and I'd sit on a rock or a stump or on the side there, and I'd just read my Bible, and I I would pray, and as I'd go about my day, I would just talk to him continually, and to be honest with you, I tried to imagine like he would imagine. I tried to think like he would think. I tried to respond uh, like he would respond. I tried to, well, uh, speak as he would speak, and so I just simply would focus myself on him in a very, well, laser-like way. Each night I would go to bed and I would read a, the passage one more time, just focused on him. Well, then the next week or so, I began to think about this next phrase, and here it is, that I may in that same way come to know the power of his resurrection. You know, here's what I thought. I thought, Lord, if you could give me that kind of dynamic in my life, I mean, the power of his resurrection, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, if he could give me that same sort of dynamic in my own life, I mean, who knows? I might be able to speak to one or two of my friends about you, but I'm going to need your help. And so I give you this part of the verse, and I ask you to make it a reality. And interestingly enough, as I prayed this on a regular basis, 
It wasn't long after I was able to lead two really good friends to Christ. It was awesome. It was the first two people I've ever led to the Lord. They may have been the first two people I ever really spoke to about the Lord. It was such a, an encouragement. It was such a big deal. And you say, well, two friends, that's not that big a deal. I mean, come on, man. Hey, some people might consider these two guys in my fraternity house a revival. And then I have that next little phrase that I may share in his sufferings. I don't mind telling you this one's scary. It wasn't an easy thing to do. I, I, was, I was in the middle of a period of life that was pretty lonely. You see, all of my friends up to that point had really abandoned me because of my faith. They were chasing one thing, and I began to chase after Christ. And we just went two separate ways. And in some cases, it wasn't really all that amicable. They felt like I abandoned them. So here we go about our ways. It's a pretty tough time. It was starting to get a little bit better at this point because a few of my friends were starting to well, come to faith. They were uh, beginning to ask questions and beginning to come around and the hostility and the, the wall between us was, was crashing. But it was still a really tough, tough time. You know, I often wonder after 20 years of pastoral ministry, I believe many people come to faith in the hopes that all their troubles will simply evaporate once they believe and they begin to follow Christ. You know, there's a lot of popular preachers out there who proclaim this false gospel. It's a doctrine they call the, the word of faith. Now, up to this point, I'd been a Christian now for, for a little while, for some time, but I still had expected the Lord to make things easy because now I'm all in, Lord. I'm fully with you. I'm, I'm serving you. I mean, I still expected him to make things easy for those of us who are saved and are called his sons. I mean, hey, I chose to follow you, Lord. I chose to obey your words. I chose to, to chase after you, and my life was flipped, well, on its head. And, well, you should kind of, like, give me some bonus points or something here, right? That's not how it works. There are few people in the world who have enjoyed more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus than Paul. Few have experienced the joy that Paul reports in his letters throughout his ministry to the churches he's writing to. Yet you got to understand something about Paul. There are very few people on this earth who have suffered, well, more than him. His unguarded words to the believers in Corinth really sum up a few of his, well, sufferings and a few of his issues. Just look at what he goes through here as he really kind of lets, uh, let, lets loose to that church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if, I, as if insane. I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Wow. Paul has been through it, hasn't he? Have you noticed that experience is sometimes the most convincing authority a teacher can have? I don't really care how much you understand the text until you've lived it out. And Paul has lived out what we're about to study this morning. Paul's body bore the scars of suffering for the sake of Christ, and, and each mark commemorates a victory for Christ. Perhaps no other person on the earth could have encouraged the Romans so effectively. Remember, the Romans are beleaguered and beaten up. The Romans are, are battered and bruised. And here comes Paul, perfectly equipped to speak into their lives. And if you recall, in the book of Acts... It was a move of God turning the hearts of kings and governors and leaders to get him there. 
And so having assured his readers that, hey, the Lord will be faithful. He's going to be faithful to complete in you, uh, believers in Rome, what he has started. But now he needs to address another question, a, a more obvious question for, well, the church at Rome, and to be honest with you, for you and I. We learned back in Romans 8 that there is now no more condemnation for the believer, right? We, we learned back in chapter, the beginning of chapter 8 that we are all sons of God if we're in Christ Jesus. So here's the question. If there is now no more condemnation, and if I'm now a son of God, why do I feel like I'm always being punished? That's the question he answers in this next passage. So would you stand with me in honor of reading the word of God in word verse 18 to 26? 27. So here he begins to answer that question. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So Father, bless the reading of your word. Help us to answer this question and to understand it from the scriptures. In Christ's name, amen. So if you want to follow along, the notes are in the bulletin or they're on the app as well. So what, we, what we've just seen here is Paul has just declared that the Holy Spirit continually affirms the believer's place in God's family as one of his children. That's what we learned back in 816. Uh, he's affirming to the Romans that uh, regardless of what life throws at you, you are secure in God's family. And because you're secure in God's family, he teaches in Romans 8.17 that now you're going to share in Christ's inheritance. That means you get all the blessings, but you're also going to get some of the sufferings. You're going to get the glory, but you also got to get the groaning. And so now, the apostle is not trying to minimize the intensity of, of our present distress, whatever you're going through this morning, including his own which, let me tell you, is more severe than most of us will ever care to live under. But everything we just read about Paul back in 2 Corinthians and the hardships he faced, did you see what he says about it? It's but a mere fraction of the future splendor that I'm going to receive in glory. He said, just but a little bit. Alan Redpath, in The Making of a Man of God, says, There is no victory without a fight, and there is no battle without wounds. Man, that's the truth. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not suggesting whatsoever that we try to pay for our glory with groaning or that sanctification can be purchased with suffering. You know, throughout Christian history, well-meaning men and women have literally beaten themselves with rods and whips trying to overcome the flesh and to receive more of the Holy Spirit of God. But it's interesting, some of these very same people, they learned and they discovered that, well, sanctification, the process of sanctifying yourself by beating yourself, doesn't hurt nearly as bad, as bad if I put on some really thick leather under my robes, which of course is what? Absurd, right? They're just going through the motions. So let me tell you, senseless pain or, you know, does not fast track you to spiritual maturity. So let me just give you a, a quick practical tip. Don't go looking for suffering, my friends. Just living authentically in Christ will help you encounter plenty of suffering on its own. When you learn to deny self and obey the scriptures and follow Jesus in a fallen world as Jesus did, it will bring enough suffering 
all by itself. And that brings me there to that second fill in the blank in your notes. Do you see it? Affliction allows us to share some measure of his suffering. Now, we've been taught by Paul, we've been taught in Scripture that we are inheriting the blessing and the suffering. And so we, affliction allows us to share some measure of his suffering. I mean, you've got to understand, after all, Jesus warned us. He warned us that the world would afflict us just as it did him for no other reason than simply the mere fact that we have broken ranks with evil. Let me take you back to my college years. I finally decided there had to be more to life than what I was living. And I saw Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. And I had rededicated my life to live for him fully. I was the same person, the same friend I was, well, the days and the weeks leading up to this. But because I had put my faith and my trust in Christ, I had broken ranks with, well, the ways of the world. I now, instead of having 140 best friends in the house, had many of them who wanted to fight me. They thought I had abandoned them. They thought I was disloyal to them. John 15 says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hates you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And so I guess you could say in a practical sense, suffering tells us we're on the right path. So my very first trip to Haiti, I was told, we're going to go to the Fellowship School of Hope. Now, to get to the Fellowship School of Hope, you're going to go down a really steep decline, and you're going to cross the river. Then you're going to go up an incline. It's really bumpy. And then, well, when you get to the part of the road that has been completely washed out, and you're kind of driving up and over canyons, and the truck is swaying and bouncing so hard, your bones feel like they're just kind of chattering together. About the moment it's hard to breathe, and you're a bit, well, bruised, and it starts to hurt, guess what? You're going to be to the school. So, on my first trip out there, with each bump and each bone-jarring jolt, it kept telling me, I guess we're on the right path. Never been here before, but it hurts. And they said it would hurt as you get slammed around in the back of the pickup. By the way, if you go, get there early and ride in the front. <laughs> Hebrews 5.8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. You see, obedience led Jesus to a torturous death. Paul followed Christ down the very same path of suffering, and it led to his martyrdom. And so what we're going to find in the following verses now is an invitation from Paul to simply follow me, Paul, as I follow Jesus. Look at it in verse 19. Do you see what's going on here? Check it out with me. Verse 19. Um, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And so you've got to understand here, our suffering after adoption as sons is not the result of some senseless beating by, well, God. While the creator remains sovereign over his creation, the bad things that happen to us are, they're not his original desire. The bad things that happen to us in this life, listen, my friends, the bad things you're going through right now are not part of his original plan. It's not part of the original design. He never created you to endure pain. He never created you to, to wither under disease. He, he never created you to crave with the depths of your soul, well, evil and wickedness the way we do. My friends, God created you to worship. He created you to enjoy him forever and ever. Look at your notes there. Death is the ultimate affront to his creative act of design. He never created us to die. Have you ever wondered why we're sitting here a week out from Thanksgiving 
almost 2020, and how many of us have said, where did the time go? We were never meant to live encapsulated in a fallen world, well, ensconced in time. We are created to be eternal beings, which is why months seem like moments. It's why decades seem like days. God never created us to live like this. You know, death is the result of sin. It's a perversion of his original design. Death is an enemy. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And man, I don't know about you, but hallelujah, amen. Now, understand, the story of creation in Genesis... The story of creation, all the way back at the beginning, it ends with the pristine world where every blade of grass is jade green, every stream is crystal clear, every tree is chock full of fruit, and God says it's all good. That's how it ends. And then he gives it as a gift to his first children, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve took this beautiful, wonderful world as their inheritance, and they became its managers. Look at Genesis 127. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. But then, listen my friends, the the children of God exchange truth for a lie. They sell their inheritance as sons for bondage into slavery. They open the door for disease and disaster and death and decay for every one of us, and it enters into God's most perfect, idyllic world. Hey, by the way, as an aside, what truth have you laid aside for a lie this morning? What lies are you believing? Now, remember, If you're in Christ, for the believer, Satan has zero power over you except the power to get you to believe his lies. And if you'll simply be reoriented to the truth of scriptures and you'll, you'll, uh, well, flee his lies, he has no power over you whatsoever. So what truth have you exchanged for a lie? I was counseling an individual the other day, and they were buying into the lie of the enemy that If I don't fulfill the desire of my heart, although it is, well, sinful according to the Bible, if I don't fulfill it, I'm not being true to myself. That doesn't sound like Bible to me. That sounds like what? Meology 101. But they said, I'm going to miss out. God has put this desire in me for a reason. I go, oh, my friend, that's not God's desire. That's your flesh. You see, their problem was their their desire was sinful. And what havoc will it wreak upon his family and upon his sphere of influence if this individual decides, well, to partake of that sinful desire? Well, we know what it did with Adam and Eve, and the ramifications are still being felt today. And I can guarantee you that generations down the line of his family will feel the same. So what we see Paul doing here is he's painting a picture of creation moaning in desperate, anguished anticipation of a future event. Did you notice it there in verse 19? He's painting a picture that the world is moaning and is looking forward to something. Look at it in verse 19. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So what's going on here? Notice how he describes this future event. Not the revealing of God's plan, which of course it will be, but the revealing of the sons of God. Now it gives you a little subtle suggestion that maybe all the sons of God are a bit of a mystery. So I think we might get to heaven and, well, there's going to be some people that we're surprised to see there. And there's going to be other people that we're surprised aren't there. 
Here's what you got to understand. When humankind fell, creation fell. When God restores the believing remnant of humanity, creation is going to be completely restored. This is what creation is groaning for, is for, well, recreation in the end when, when Christ is set up as king and all things are made right. The Lord himself will rule. The desert, the Bible says, will blossom uh, like a rose, and the lamb and the lion will lie together, and sin will have, sin will have no place. And that's going to be a great day, but here's the problem me and you have is we live now. So in the meantime, as we live right now, what do we do? And so until that day in the future, creation groans in anguished anticipation like a mother in labor of what's to come. So I'll give you a quick outline in your notes there. It's the groaning of creation is temporary. I want you to understand something. This will not go on forever. That's what verse 19 tells us. The groaning of creation is a consequence of sin. Verse 20. We're in the state we are because of Adam and Eve's original sin. And my friends, we're not off the hook. We sin just as bad. The groaning of creation is a means to an end. That's what we learn in verse 20 and 21. And the groaning of creation is universal, verse 22. Now look at verse 23 here as we move on. Look at verse 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Now, because you and I are an integral part of creation, we too groan. And you've experienced this. You understand what it is to groan according to what Paul's saying. We, we groan because of these inescapable hardships of life. Maybe you've experienced one or two of them. Maybe you've experienced broken relationships or you've experienced some natural disaster or, or terminal illness in your family and, well, the inevitable death of someone that you've loved or financial ruin. We, we all groan because of well, the sin that is in this world that, that makes it tough to, to live the life we were originally designed to live. And we groan because the flesh, that, that sinful nature Paul talked about earlier in Romans, it, it keeps us from enjoying complete and uninterrupted intimacy with our Creator. And so we groan because it's what we really desire, but yet at the same time we don't. You know, it's like this. This is the picture Paul's trying to paint, I believe. As we groan knowing there's a better day. Not that long ago, number five, it's two and a half, I heard him let out a loud wail. You know, he's screaming. Something that hurt him. So I come around the corner and around the wall and around the couch and I see him and he's crying and he's got these big tears just falling out of his face. And as he sees me and I see him and our eyes lock, immediately his arms go up and he comes running full steam ahead to be picked up and wrapped up into his daddy's arms. You see, my friends, he's groaning from the pain and suffering of whatever happened to him. Maybe number four slapped him now. The fix was the love of his father. Remember a few weeks ago we learned that our father is Abba? It's that term of endearment of daddy. We groan because innately within us, we know this was not how we were created to live. But as believers, we look forward to the day that we will lock eyes with our Savior and he will envelop us in his arms and he will take away the sins of the world and make all things right. And so we eagerly await that day. And let me tell you, my friends, creation eagerly awaits that day. Now, in the same way, look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So look at your notes there. The Spirit groans on our behalf, but with purpose. So when I begin to think in my suffering that God is cruel and he's left me all alone in my suffering, I need to reorient myself to the truth of the Scriptures, not believe the lie of the enemy. And I remember, oh, yes, the Holy Spirit himself is moaning and groaning with 
this deepness that words can't express. When I, as a pastor, have witnessed a, a mother sobbing over the loss of a little one, I know the Holy Spirit suffers her anguish. When I see a daughter, like we watched yesterday at the funeral, bury her mom, I know the Holy Spirit feels her ache. Listen, he is the spirit of our creator. He's the one who made these bodies to reflect his glory, not suffer disease and disaster and death and decay. Listen, he loves you more than you love yourself. And so he groans with you. And here's the good news. He groans and he has power. We do not. So at the end of our strength, we groan and that's it. We just end up in a heap on the floor. But the spirit groans with purpose. And so when we're at the very end of ourselves and there's nothing left in our sorrow. All we can do is look to him and say, Daddy, Abba, Father. The spirit groans for us. And he prays with wisdom for the things that we don't have, well, the mind to even think to pray at the moment. He asks for those things that we don't even know how to ask for. He's there at the end of ourselves. And my friends, so many of us as believers never get there because we are so, well, just gripped upon our own lives. And we want to be God for ourselves. We need to relinquish control of our own lives and let him be God so we can get to the end of ourselves where he takes over. Now, very quickly here, I want to give you two life principles about suffering. Let's wrap this up quickly. Two life principles about suffering. So the problem of evil is difficult for everybody. I don't care who you are. The problem of evil is hard to understand. Unbelievers struggle to comprehend how a good and powerful God can allow it. And while we as believers, we begin to question the very same thing when the intensity of sorrow and suffering become, well, unbearable. I mean, even creation itself groans in anguished anticipation because of, well, the suffering that this world is going through. But understand, Paul considers the present suffering that he's going through, that you and I are going through, to be something so very minor when it's compared to the glory of heaven. So here it is, number one. The greater the groan, the greater the glory. God is not the source of pain, and he did not promise to prevent our suffering. Instead, here's what he promises to do, that no pain will ever go to waste. You see, what the world intends to harm us, what Satan wants to use to destroy us, God will use for our good. Not only will he make us more like his son through our sufferings, but he will use our afflictions and our sorrows to, to give us a greater capacity for future blessing. And so I go back to my college days, and I'm walking... Well, back then, it seemed like the most horrific path a person could walk. Today, a blip on the radar. But it was hurtful and painful and lonely as, well, as I choose to walk with Christ, my friends abandoned me, which compelled me to move back to Kansas City. And out of that loneliness compelled me to plug into a local church and to meet a mentor and to be discipled. And because of that initial pain... It set me on the trajectory of my life that I'm here. Hey, when you find yourself suffering, rest assured that however deeply you hurt, your joy will be greater when the trial ends so we can endure in hope. There's a second principle to suffering. The weaker our spirit, the stronger his support. Man, I recall so many times back in those early days and even throughout well, the last 20 some odd years when it just felt like I barely had the strength to continue in whatever pain or heartache I was experiencing. But I knew that the Spirit was with me and he encouraged me and he strengthened me. Why would he do that? I'm convinced that it was because, well, I was at my end. There was nowhere else for me to go. I had given up and it was only his power at work in me. You know, Paul is teaching that I gain his power through my weakness. And so when pain and suffering brings you to your knees, that is when God's power has the greatest effect. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So here's the bottom line. Look at your notes there. When affliction and suffering bring you to your knees, that is when the power of God has the greatest effect in your life. 
Now let's boil it down real quick. We will all walk through suffering. We will all have hardship. We will all have sorrow. And we have two choices. Believe the lies of the enemy, cave to pressure, and be destroyed. Or reorient ourselves to truth. So here's what I want you to do. We created this little card here. We created this card this week. It's in the bulletin to simply put somewhere that you'll find it. So the next time you're walking through distress and the enemy is lying to you, you can reorient yourself to truth very quickly and very practically. And so when you're going through some tough times, number one, don't assume you're suffering as a result of God's punishment because it's not. God is not punishing you. Your sins have been forgiven. Do expect that when the suffering ends, he will give you even greater joy. Hey, when you're going through suffering, don't assume the Lord has abandoned you because he has not. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But do confess your fear and doubt and ask him for strength to continue. Hey, tell him, hey, I know you're there, but I feel like you've abandoned me. I feel like you're going to leave me. When you're working through some hard times, don't assume you've been rejected or forgotten by Christ. But do remain faithful to your duties, even, your, even if you must reduce your load for a time. Hey, maybe you need to you know, back down and relax and have some focused time with him. The next time you're suffering, don't assume your prayers are not heard. He hears every prayer. He may not be answering them the way you want him to. He may not be answering them on your timeline, but he hears your prayers. Do continue praying even when you don't know what to say. Don't assume your suffering gives you permission to give up. Oh, that's the greatest lie of the enemy. Oh, you're suffering so much. Just give up. Just quit. Lie down. Lie back. Give up. But do trust that the Lord will magnify his strength through your weakness. You know, maybe this morning as Sean comes to play, you need God to do a great thing in your life. You need him to carry the load of some hardship, some suffering, some sorrow of your own life. Give it to him. Release the grip. You can do it right there in the quietness of your own seat. You can come to the altar. I'll be here as well. Perhaps you're ready to give your life to Christ. You're ready to believe that the Lord Jesus is who he says he is. The one who came to earth and lived a sinless life. Who went to the cross to shed his blood to give you forgiveness of sins. Who died and rose again on the third day. Man, I'd love to explain more to you about that. Would you stand with me as I pray? And then if you need prayer, I'll be right here. Father in heaven, oh, would you show us the Holy Spirit of God in our lives? Right here in this moment, let us know that every believer, according to your word, is never alone that you walk right alongside of us, that you're there to encourage and to strengthen us and to comfort us. Lord, you know the needs in this room. I pray that we could hear the still small voice in Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, I'll be right here or whatever the Lord's saying to you, right there in the quietness of your seat, obey, act.